And then I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, to Nick to to go over a little bit of some of the organizational updates and the things that uh, the recent happenings at uh, at NDA. So uh, Nick, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Kip. Appreciate it. And I will be at the Habitat module uh, later this year. Hope to see some folks there. Uh, it's hard to get out of that one, Kip. I think it's probably 15 or 20 minutes from the house. Uh, looking forward to that. Looking forward to seeing folks there. And also, I might have with me, I'd like to get, uh, we, we recently hired our Chief Development Officer, Lauren Varner. Uh, I'd like to get her there as well. Uh, so we'll get a chance to meet her here, hopefully bring her onto the show here. Uh, one of these months. So uh, as Kip said, yeah, we start off with the organizational update, which I'm always really uh, proud and happy to do, because when I get this list, I feel like we did all this in a month, uh, which is good. So it's a good reminder of how hard the team's working here, and they are working really hard, and we've got a pretty good list here. So without further ado, I think I'll jump into it. Uh, on the branch front, a lot going on for branches. We created a custom NDA slash event groove is the system that we use fundraising site for our online fundraising, uh, hopefully making life easier on our branches uh, that, that want to do the local front fundraisers we certainly appreciate. Uh, we updated our branch policy and procedures manual and event guide. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at that. We've also created a new branch fundraising toolkit. Uh, so again, a lot of tools to hopefully make life easier on everybody out there. Uh, our conservation seed program, this is something we only did for branches. Uh, 24 different branches participated in that this year. We ordered uh, over 200,000 pounds of seed, and uh, that's going to plant about 6,300 acres. Or if you're a little stingy like me, you'll probably stretch that out a little bit and then wonder why it's thin later. Uh, but at any rate, uh, that's a great program. We're glad that a lot of people were able to take advantage of that and get seed at really pennies on the dollar, really inexpensively. Uh, we're continuing to plan our field to fork events for the year and our branch involvement is continuing to increase. Again, if you are interested and your branch is not already doing a field to fork event, please get in touch with us, get in touch with Hank Forrester and we'll be glad to get you rolling on that. Uh, the more of those that we do, the more people we introduce to this sport, the better. And also our Share Your Hunt program, that continues to provide resources, uh, insurance, backgrounds check, blaze orange vests, pretty much everything you need from start to finish for our branches. Uh, they're going to be hosting hunts. Uh, again, contact Hank Forrester or uh, Mike Edwards if you want some information on that or some help to get going. Uh, switching gears a little bit here, we just hosted a Deer Steward Hunting Property Evaluation mod uh, Module in Missouri. That was just last weekend. And we're going to host the Deer Steward Habitat Enhancement Module, as Kip said, uh, uh, or in early August in Pennsylvania. And, and all of us here on the call will be there. So again, hope to see you there. Uh, our first project on the DeSoto National Forest is underway, and we're enhancing habitat on 45,000 acres there, folks, for hunters. So um, that's an important project. I think you're going to see more and more conservation on the ground uh, happening here from the national level. And related to that, we just submitted a proposal. We've been working closely with the folks at Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's, uh, the Outdoor Fund. Uh, if you're like me, you've spent far too much money in those stores over the years. And whenever you're checking out, they ask you if you want to round up for conservation. Uh, we benefit from that. So hopefully you're saying yes every time. Uh, you know, don't be like my dad that if it's more than a quarter, he'll say no. Uh, so always say yes to the roundup for conservation because it helps us because we're going to submit a proposal to them uh, that'll enhance if it's, if it's uh, accepted. It'll enhance habitat and hunter access on more than a million acres of public land. And that's a heck of an accomplishment. One of the things we know about hunting access is it's not just about access to land to go to, it has to be decent land. And so that's what we're gonna be doing here, improving some existing public land and making it more palatable for hunters. Uh, speaking of good land to hunt on the back 40 property, which we've talked about many, many times is now officially owned by the National Deer Association. So we're the owners. Uh, as of this weekend, uh, the back 40 is completely planted with soybeans and the food plots and uh, switchgrass, tall grass prairie, native short grass prairie, just a good diversity of habitat there. Thanks to our habitat committee and the Southeast Michigan branch. Uh, and of course, Meat Eater and First Light, uh, those who donated the property to us, uh, to us continue to remain engaged, which is, which is a really good thing. Continue to be excited about what we're going to be able to do with the back 40. Uh, also, our new 16-episode How to Hunt Deer podcast series, uh, which is co-hosted in part by uh, NDA's Hank Forrester, who I've mentioned already a couple times here tonight, and Matt Ross, who you're going to hear from uh, here in just a second. Uh, so Dan Johnson, our friend over at Sportsman's Nation, if, if you're unaware of Sportsman's Nation, it's a family of podcasts 
uh, hunting and outdoors related podcast. Just go ahead and Google up Sportsman's Nation. You'll find it. Uh, it's going to serve as a never before done audio guide on introducing deer hunting to all ages. And so uh, we're trying to keep up here and be modern with how we share this information. I think this is going to be a great series. Uh, and again, released through the Sportsman's Nation and our, our good friend, Dan Johnson. That's going to start early next month. So uh, pay attention for that. I'm sure we'll continue to put alerts out and make sure you, you know what's happening there. Uh, on the policy front. So yeah, we, we actually were doing the work on the ground and we're doing the work in the state and federal legislatures. Uh, we're working closely with many of our partners to draft language and gather support to continue to deal with chronic wasting disease. Um, it's, it's a subject that we hate having to talk about, but we're just going to have to talk about it because it's a big thing, a big part of what we work on. And uh, you may have noticed this uh, specifically uh, in Pennsylvania, Minnesota, and Texas, there have been some recent uh, outbreaks on, on deer farms. And so we're working hard to try to uh, curb the amount of deer movement that's going on, try to limit spread of the disease from those operations. Uh, and and it just continues to be a big issue. So that's something we're gonna continue to work on. Uh, the public comment period is still open on the hunting and fishing expansion, expansion opportunities on uh, national wildlife refuge, uh, refuges and natural, excuse me, national fish hatcheries. Uh, continue to look for that. There are 939 new opportunities across 2.1 million acres. So again, that's huge impact for people. Uh, if you're someone that relies on public lands and waters, this is something you need to pay attention to. Uh, moving to the state level, our New York Youth Hunting Initiative, we've mentioned this in the past. Uh, there's a, pr a provision included in the budget to allow youth 12 to 13 years old to hunt deer with a firearm. Uh, yes, believe it or not, they could not do that, cannot do that in New York until hopefully this uh, passes. Uh, but the catch to this is that the individual counties have to opt in to allow this, uh, which is a little bit odd, uh, but it is what it is. It's a hoop we'll jump through. Right now, uh, 26 counties have opted in so far. And uh, reach out if you need help engaging uh, your county or if your county hasn't opted in, let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll try to help you out there. Uh, also in New York, our hunting hours initiative. This is another uh, quirky thing about New York. Uh, so I think, I believe it's every other state, legal hunting hours are typically a half hour before sunrise and a half hour after sunset, uh, not in New York. Uh, however, that is now uh, after some of our good work is now made their final deer plan. So it's in there and it's open for comment. Uh, look for an action alert coming from our friend Torin Miller on that soon. Uh, slip over to communications real quick here. We have two new podcasts. These are coming directly from the National Deer Association. They're going to launch on June 30th, and the two podcasts are called Deer Season 365 and Coffee and Deer. So uh, real quickly on that, Deer Season 365 is going to be more for uh, discussing hunting and property management topics, the type of things that you typically see from us uh, in, our, in our resource gallery or in our, in our magazine. Uh, and Coffee and Deer is going to be less technical and going to be focused more on hunting heritage. So sort of more deer hunting stories and uh, some, some behind the scenes stuff on the National Deer Association. As a matter of fact, I can already tell you the, the first Coffee and Deer, uh, our first guest is, is Lindsay Thomas Jr., our Chief Communications Officer. So again, a chance to get a little inside info on the National Deer Association. So uh, Brian Grossman will be hosting Deer Season 365, and I'll actually be hosting Coffee and Deer with my good friend and longtime NDA member Mike Groman. So check that out. Uh, finally, the summer issue of Quality Whitetails magazine is at the press, and it'll be coming out soon. Uh, that got uploaded at the end of last week. And there will be an NDA decal included with your magazine this time. So I know you read them all cover to cover, but definitely make sure you read this one cover to cover so you don't miss your decal. Uh, they may be stuck on the back, but they also might be slipped. I'm not going to tell you how you're going to get them because I want you to make sure you check out the full magazine. But also, uh, this is something Lindsay wanted me to tell you. If you're not already an NDA member, and I can't imagine anybody on here would not be a member, but if you're one of those people, uh, if you become a member quickly here, you'll still get this next issue of the magazine and you'll get the decal. So don't delay. Uh, jump off this call as soon as we're done and, and go sign up. Make sure that you are a current member. So with that, a little long winded, but I, I just couldn't be prouder of the team and all the different things that they're doing for deer and hunters. And it's impressive. And I can tell you that this is frankly, this is just a summary of a lot of the things going on. So with that, let's turn it back over to Kip and, and he'll turn it over to Matt.
It might be frozen. All right, cool. Uh, see all the good stuff come out. All right, Matt, are you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. Folks, uh, anybody who's been around uh, our organization for a while, certainly Matt Ross is no stranger to anybody. Matt, a spy like Georgia and his sister, our director of conveying, uh, uh, by my side for than I've known my wife. So uh, I am uh, proud uh, to, to be his colleague and uh, friend and certainly looking forward to what he has put together for you tonight. So uh, Matt, I will turn it over to you uh, as my normal co-host on this, but uh, you get to be the star tonight as the presenter. Take it away and teach us how to, uh, to be a jawbone aging expert uh, in five simple steps. The floor is yours. All right, let's see if we can uh, get this looking right. Is it still in the right view there, Kipster? It, uh, it's in the presenter view right now. Okay. How about that? You got it. All right. We get, we got it on the money. All right. So, you know, aging jawbones on deer is a, is a fun activity, but it's, it's more than just a G whiz activity. Um, we can learn a lot about deer ages and, and not to go full deer nerd on you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why we do it. But mostly this evening, we're going to teach you how to actually look at a jawbone with your eyes and assess the, the age based on a couple different principles. But as Kip saw uh, before I was able to show a little animation, it really comes down to five questions. If you can go through five simple steps and ask five simple questions uh, and, and know what the answers are for each one of those, you'll get the age of the deer. And I've taught a lot of people how to age jawbones over the years, and I've learned some from some of the best. So I'm, I'm passing on some of my own experience. And I saw the names uh, that are attending here tonight. I, there's a couple of people that I've taught. Um, Kip is one of the people that has taught me. And uh, when we end here, we'll be able to answer any questions. And we have lots of other resources that I want to mention here at the beginning. Um, we have all kinds of things for you. If after tonight you really still feel uncomfortable with it, but you want to know the age of a deer that you harvest this upcoming fall or in the future, you can always take a picture of the jawbone and send it to the NDA. And the photo on the bottom right is just pulled from one of the articles that we have on our website um, that is, in essence, that how to photograph a jawbone and send it to us to tell you how old it is. So you can find that on our website and we do that all the time. There's a couple different angles that you need to take the picture from, uh, but we'd be happy to age a deer for you uh, or at least give you a second opinion. So try to keep that in, the, in your memory bank. The photo on the top right is a screenshot of a three-part series of videos that have, has literally been viewed over half a million times on our YouTube channel. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend going to look at it. Uh, part one goes through the tooth replacement part of this method I'm gonna teach you. Part two is the tooth wear uh, part of the technique. And then there's a little fun test, which is part three. But altogether, that's been viewed 509,000 times on YouTube. And you, you can go back and view that uh, after this evening. We also have a series of educational posters and I have the deer jawbone removing and aging poster on display and that's gonna be part of the prize tonight. So we already gave that away. We're gonna give away three posters and uh, that is one of the ones that somebody tonight will win it. If you don't win it, you can always buy that through our store, The Shed, just by going online and they're laminated uh, large posters that can teach you the technique. And just one final extra resource, um, I'm showing you a PDF two-page informational brochure that we have called Jawbone Talk, and my colleague Ben Williams, uh, Ben Westfall, uh, is going to uh, put that in the chat for you all. So Ben, if you could drop that link for everybody, and you guys can download that and uh, have a copy of it uh, to look at afterwards as well. So why do we do it? We, do, we mostly age them on the, on the deer nerd side to be able to compare within age and sex classes. So being able to say, are bucks changing over time as we implement our management? Are does changing over time? Are their weights getting bigger? Are they dropping? Are their antlers getting bigger? Are they getting smaller? Or are they staying the same? You can only compare across those if you know the true age of the deer. And so by doing that, it helps us to, to determine what we're going to do in terms of harvest and be able to track our progression over time. That's really why we do it. 
And to be able to really know the age of a jawbone or, or of the deer that the jawbone came from, we can go through some basic uh, vocabulary of the terms of, of the jawbone. And you may have held a jawbone in your hands before. Uh, at the front uh, of the jawbone is the incisors. There's a long space there on the right the, until you get to the, the uh, premolars and molars. And I'll talk about those in a, in a minute. But there you have the incisors on the far right. On the tongue side of the teeth, um, is the higher part of the, the, the teeth called the lingual crests. It's a little counterintuitive. You would actually think that the teeth would slope outwards um, so that the food would kind of fall towards where the tongue is, but it doesn't work that like that. They shear the vegetation that they're eating by having that sharp side and the higher ridge closer to the tongue. And the outside is called the buccal side or the cheek side. Uh, I mentioned the premolars and the molars. So this slide shows that uh, the first three teeth are the premolars and we refer to them as P1, P2, and P3. So you'll hear those terms throughout the presentation. And then the molars are the three teeth in the back, molar one, molar two, and molar three. And that's pretty important. Which teeth are there is gonna be a big part of how you know with high certainty how old a deer can be. And then the the actual composition of the teeth and how it's made up, there's a couple different colors you're seeing there. You're seeing browns and whites. Um, the brown that's facing you on the, the buckle side, there's some staining there, but when you look straight down on the tooth, um, the brown is the dentine. That's the dark kind of center of the tooth. And it's coated by a shiny white enamel. And, and you'll hear me refer to these terms again as we go through it. Uh, there's two main aging methods here. Um, there's the cementum annuli technique, which I'll discuss very briefly, and then the tooth replacement and wear technique. And that's commonly referred to as the severing house technique, at least in the research world. Um, there was a technique established in the 40s by a gentleman, uh, Dr. Severing House, and that's why it's referred to that. And they're very different, but both involve the lower jawbone. You can't really tell the age of a deer from the teeth on the top part of the skull. So they both involve the lower jawbone, the incisors, as you can see in the photo on the, on the right towards the top of the photo, uh, we use for cementum and the molars and premolars are used for the tooth replacement and wear technique. Uh, the, the cementum annuli technique involves counting, in essence, growth rings uh, and a stain cross section of the root of the deer's tooth. The incisor is used the most. Uh, you can send in other teeth, and I'll tell you an example about that in a little bit, but they, you need special equipment to do this, um, and it costs some time and money. You have to mail them away. Um, some of the advantages there, though, it's less subjective than the technique that I'm gonna teach you tonight, and it is more accurate for older animals. Uh, I'll show you kind of a display here of what I mean in a second, but the three labs that really do this professionally, commercially for hunters are listed on this slide. You can snap a picture. You can go back on YouTube after this is posted. Um, and we also have them listed on, on our website in a variety of places. But there's a couple places in Montana. There's a place in Michigan. And those are the only ones, at least that I know, that you can actually send uh, the incisors in. And it takes several weeks to get back. Cost varies anywhere from $25 to $65, $70 a tooth. Um, but in some of the cases on the examples I'm showing here, you can batch them together and, and get some cost savings. But that's the cement annuli. Why would somebody want to do that? Well, and send a tooth in. The cementum annuli method is actually, as I mentioned, more accurate for the older ages. Um, and as you can see here, this accuracy level, um, they're about even. The method I'm going to teach you tonight. Um, tooth replacement and wear and cement manuli are about the same accuracy around three and a half years of age. So if the deer was actually three and a half, they, they have the same accuracy. For younger deer, tooth replacement and wear, wear technique, the one I'm going to teach you, is actually more accurate than spending money and sending a tooth in. Um, but if you get a deer that you think is of advanced age, really old, the accuracy does increase with the one that you send in a tooth. And you might want to learn by uh, sending that in. Now let's talk about tooth replacement and wear. Uh, it does have two names in it or replacement and wear because it really involves two processes. The tooth replacement technique or part is the process of gaining additional teeth over time and replacing temporary teeth with permanent ones. I have two little kids. 
they're still losing some teeth and, and growing some new ones. Um, this is why we have such high accuracy at the younger ages is deer up until two years of age are still replacing some teeth. And by being able to determine which teeth are in the jawbone, you can have a hundred percent accuracy on the age just by looking at that part of the process. The tooth wear is where the subjectiv subjectivity comes in, where you're actually looking at all the adult teeth and you're judging how worn down they are with time by looking at how much a dentine is showing. And I'll describe that in detail. Um, the tooth replacement part, again, I mentioned, they are born with three temporary teeth. These are the premolars that I mentioned a few minutes ago. But by about a year and a half of age, they've gained not only their three permanent molars, but they've replaced their temporary premolars with permanent ones. All deer that are 18 months of age or older should have six permanent teeth on each side of the lower jaw. And that's gonna be a key aspect that I'll talk about in a minute. The tooth wear part of the technique, and if you can imagine this is the side view of a tooth, uh, where the inside is that dark dentine and it's got the white coating of enamel on the outside, the more wear it, it, it experiences, the more uh, dentine is exposed. And you can imagine if you're looking down from the top of the slide, the, the brown is going to get wider and wider and wider. And I'll show you some graphics here in a minute that display that. Um, I, the way when I teach some people, kids and adults, I think of it like the Tootsie Roll uh, Center Owl, where he just kept licking the lollipop until he exposed the, the Tootsie Roll. That's really what's happening here. The deer wearing down that enamel coating to the point where more and more dentine is being shown. There are some distinct advantages to this. Obviously, it doesn't cost you anything. You can just do it um, and be able to, to look at it and do it in real time and say, that's how old that deer was. The disadvantages of clearly are that it's more subjective and it's highly dependent on the experience of the individual ager. You got to actually look at lots of jail bones from the place that you're hunting and do some uh, ground truthing, you know, maybe send some teeth in to, with the cemento manuli uh, test to come back and say, uh, are you, are you underaging on average? Are you overaging on average? Or are you kind of on the middle? And that way, when you're on the fence between two ages, you can say, you know what, I tend to age high or tend to age low. And you, you can uh, kind of uh, scale yourself accordingly. Uh, so this is a buck that I killed in 2019. Um, I'm going to show several slides of this over the, throughout the presentation to kind of give you the experience that I went through to age, age that deer. So just, you'll, we'll come back to this slide. Um, but here's the five questions that I, or the beginning of the five questions uh, to become that expert. So if you can count to five and ask those questions, you're going to be all right and be able to go through. And I'm imagining everybody on here can do that. Um, the first question that I always ask myself when handing, handed a jawbone is I look at it from the view that you see there, the buckle side. So I'm looking from the cheek side at the teeth. And I just simply, number one, question one, how many teeth are there? And if I can answer that question and know that there are six teeth, uh, it's at least one and a half years old. If there's less than six teeth, it's likely a six month old or seven month old or eight month old uh, deer, depending on when it was, when it was killed. Um, but as long as there are six teeth, you know that it's at least one and a half years old. So that's the first question. The second question is how many cusps on the third premolar are there? And I'll go back a slide real quickly. And if you can see uh, on number two, what we call a yearling, a one and a half year old deer is going to have six teeth, but the third one back will be their temporary tooth. And if it's a, a deer that's two and a half or older, it will have six teeth, but it's going to be the permanent tooth in that position. And you'll see some images here in a second. So first question, how many teeth are there? If there are six, you know it's at least one and a half years old. If there's less, you know that it's a fawn. Second question, how many cusps on P3 are there? And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. The temporary premolar is on the bottom. It has three cusps shown by those three yellow arrows. The top jawbone is a deer that has a permanent premolar and it's got two cusps. So here it is again, and you can see the progression from fawn to the middle is a yearling where it's actually starting to replace that temporary tooth and a full adult on the top. So we're always looking at that third tooth back from the front or P3 and counting how many cusps there are. Uh, 
The key for the fawn is that there are less than six teeth. In this example, there's one, two, three. The third one has three cusps, four teeth being shown. On the yearling, it has six teeth, but the third one back is going to have a temporary premolar. So it's got the three cusps. And this one says, no, permanent tooth is actually erupting underneath it. You wouldn't see if that deer was alive, the gums would cover it, but it's getting its new tooth and it's about to replace it. And here's that buck that I showed before. How many teeth are there? Let's ask, the, let's go through the first question. Hopefully you can all see it. I got it well labeled. There's three premolars and three molars. So we know that it's at least one and a half years old. So I did not kill a fawn in 2019. How many cusps are there in the third tooth back? You can see there in the image blown up, we know that there are two. So it's at least two and a half years old. If that tooth in the third position, the P3, had three cusps or three bumps on it, it would be a yearling. So I did not kill a yearling. I killed a buck that was at least two and a half years old in 2019. I have a note all the way in the left slide that says, this is the only tooth with three cusps on this jaw. And if uh, I could show you with the, the mouse, uh, you would see there are actually three distinct sections or cusps to that tooth. And that'll come in, uh, into importance a little bit later. So hopefully everybody's following me. So that's the, that's the tooth replacement part of the method. Talking about the tooth wear part of the method. This technique is based on the width of the dentine on the molars compared. Now, again, I have molars highlighted. We're looking at the molars only. That's the three back teeth. This slide I had up earlier in the presentation, anatomy of a jawbone. The dentine is the creamy Tootsie Roll center, right? And the enamel is that white hard shell on the outside. So we're looking at the first molar or the fourth tooth back for the next question. So questions one was how many teeth are there? Again, I'm gonna repeat myself a lot in this presentation. I do this when I teach people live. If there are six teeth, you know it's at least one and a half. If there's less than six teeth, you know that it's a fawn. The second question is how many cusps on the third premolar? If there are two cusps, you know it's at least two and a half. If there are three, then you know it, it, you stay at one and a half. It's a yearling or one and a half year old buck or doe. On the third question is, is the dentine visibly wider than the surrounding enamel on the first molar? And I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm talking about. So in this example, Looking down from the very top of the jawbone, this is key. This is one of the things we ask in that blog on our website on how to take a picture is we want a photo from the outside, the cheek side, looking at the profile of the teeth, but we also want one looking straight down on the teeth from the top view. And what we're looking at is the lingual crest. That's the tongue side, the tongue side crest. And the, these white arrows are showing uh, what I'm talking about. And you're kind of taking a visible average of the width of the dentine compared to the average width of the white on either side. It's not like I'm adding those two red lines together. And here in the example on the tooth on the left, I have a, it says no. If I was going to show you that view from the top, the white is not really a lot wider. They look like they're about the same width as the the distance of the brown or the dentine. Whereas the tooth on the right, if you looked straight down on that tooth, the width of the brown or the dentine does look like it's noticeably or visibly wider than the strip of a surrounding enamel on either side. So again, it's kind of like a visual average. And this is where the subjectivity comes in. I'm looking at not only both sides, the white on the left and the right of the, of the diagram I'm showing you, but I'm actually looking at both cusps. So this will come in when I talk to you and show you a picture of uh, the buck's jawbone that I, I killed in 2019, but you're, you're using your best estimate with your eyes. Hopefully that makes sense. So if we get through questions one and two, and in question three, we say, 
is the dentine visibly wider of the enamel, the strip of enamel on M1? And we say no. If the answer to that question is no, we stay at two and a half years old. It's got six permanent teeth. It's got a permanent third premolar. This is what it says at the bottom. And the dentine is not as wide as the surrounding enamel on the first molar. So we stay at two and a half. If we say yes to that question, if we ask the same question, we say yes, we know that the deer is at least three and a half years old and we move back a tooth. So the fourth question is, is the dentine visibly wider than the surrounding enamel on the second tooth? And so if we say no to that question, we stay at three and a half. If we said yes to both questions, we know that the deer is at least four and a half years old. So again, if we say yes to question three and no to question four, we stay at three and a half. And in this example on the slide, the dentine is as wide on the first, but not the second molar. Um, and here's a key. One of the hardest two ages, or I shouldn't say one, two of the hardest ages to uh, differentiate is between two and a half and three and a half. There's a lot of deer in those age groups. A lot of people kill bucks in those age groups and they wanna know. And one of the keys to that is that last tooth, the third molar, the last cusp, that back cusp starts to show some wear. And so I blew that up here. I zoomed in for you. At three and a half, you can start to see some dentine showing on that last cup, cusp, the, the red arrow showing to it. And it's actually slanting a little bit. Um, and actually this back edge of the middle cusp also has dentine. You can see in this photo, there's a thin strip of dentine showing. That does not occur uh, at two and a half years old. And uh, let me just go back one slide. You can see on this tooth, there's no dentine showing on that back, back cusp or on that back edge of the middle cusp of the last tooth. So that's a one way that you can use to split the difference is look to see if there's any dentine showing on that very, very last cusp. If I say yes to questions three and four and I say no to question five, I stay at four and a half. Um, if I say yes, yes, yes to questions three, four, and five, the dentine is wider on all three teeth, we're at least five and a half years old. Um, and at this case, you're gonna see some severe cupping and slanting in that last cusp of the last tooth. It's the last one to erupt and that's why it starts to show. So that in a nutshell is the technique. I'm gonna give you some other guidelines here in a second that we're gonna look a little closer at the buck that I killed uh, in 2019. Uh, but deer can get pretty advanced age and there's actually ways to age even past five and a half plus. I'm stopping here to tell you that you really don't need from the deer nerd standpoint, um, you know, from a gee whiz standpoint, it's always really great to know exact ages of deer or, or get as close as possible. We'll never know the exact age. A lot of this is still guessing based on science, but it's still guessing. Uh, but deer up until five and a half, in terms of being able to manage a deer program, manage a property or a group of properties like a co-op, you don't really need to know um, past five and a half. What you can do is know whether deer are young, you know, one years old or younger, if they're those middle ages, two and three, and if they're older ages, four or older, or even five and older, and being able to, 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 de to determine based on your goals, if you wanna shoot and see older deer, and on average, the bucks that you're killing are of the middle age group, uh, how many of them are actually making it into those older ages, you can just group those and kind of stop at five and a half and it's good enough for management. Uh, but past that, being able to know a little bit of a gee whiz factor, uh, we'll talk about that. So again, you can take a photo or screenshot this, but here's my five questions. Uh, how many teeth are there? If there's six teeth, we know it's at least one and a half years old. How many cusps are there? If that third tooth back has two cusps, we know it's at least two and a half, years old. If there are three, we stay at one and a half. If the dentine is visibly wider than the surrounding enamel on M1, uh, we know it's at least three and a half. If it's a no, we stay at three and a half. Question four is the same. If we say yes, we know it's at least four and a half. 
If it's a no, we stay at three and a half. And is the dentine visibly wider on question five on that last tooth on M3? If it's a yes, we know it's at least five and a half. And if it's a no, we stay at four and a half. That is tooth replacement and wear. And now you're all an expert. How do we know older than five and a half? Well, I don't normally teach this in our Dear Steward classes, but I'll give you a quick overview of how to do this. Um, one of the things that you start seeing past five and a half is real deep cupping of the individual uh, teeth, especially the molars. Um, and one way that you can start to determine this is to look a little bit closer at those three molars. And one thing I wanna draw attention to is something called, kind of a nerdy term, but it's called the infundibulum. And that's the strip of dentine that's still showing in between the lingual crest, which is the tongue side and the buccal crest or the buccal side. Um, there's that kind of permanent spot where there's a hard ridge. If you have a tooth that starts really cupping out like M1 in this photo, um, or, the, or the infundibulum becomes like an island, uh, among the sea of dentine, you can actually go up in age. And we use the same series of three questions where I go back to M1. If I've gotten to at least five and a half years old by the questions I've offered you, and I get to the point where I think the deer is even older, I go back to M1 and say, is the infundibulum either an island or disappeared? And if it's a yes, I go back a, 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 an age. Uh, if it's a no, I stay at that age. So in this example, I would say, yes to questions three, four, and five. I would go to question six would be, what's the infundibulum on M1? And that's a yes to me. So that deer's at least six and a half. I'd go back to M2 and the infundibulum's still there and it's not an island. So I'd say no. So this deer is six and a half years old based on the technique that I'm teaching you. How old do deer really get? Um, you know, talking about once you get up to eight and a half, it's really hard to tell by tooth replacement and wear. And this is where maybe sending something in by cementum would be an advantage. Uh, this is actually a, a, a photo taken from our membership magazine called Quality Whitetails. If you're not a member, as Nick said, please join. Um, but this jawbone in the bottom was a doe taken from Georgia in 2017, sent in to one of the labs I mentioned earlier, Matson's lab, um, and it came back age range of 14 to 16 uh, with a guess of 14 years old and the age rating was a B. So they give, based on how clear the sample is, an A, B, or C scale uh, on their um, confidence of what that age is. So that, that doe that Mr. Jane's killed in 2017 was somewhere between 14 and 16 years old and their best guess was that it was 14. Um, we know just from looking at the records that in captivity, there have been several deer that have lived to 23 to 24 years old. Um, in the wild, uh, out of 327,000 samples, this lab that is on the screen, Matson's lab is the one that most state agencies, if not all, send not only deer, but all wild animals. Um, they become kind of the gold standard for, for professional managers and you can send your teeth there. I do every year. Um, out of almost 325,000 samples, the oldest wild deer they've ever aged was a 22 and a half year old doe taken from Louisiana. Um, but I can tell you from personal experience, depending on how long you may or your neighbors have abstained from shooting deer, um, especially does, they can live in the wild at, of advanced ages. And I personally have sent in samples of deer in the 15s and even one up to 20 and a half years old. So it's pretty amazing how long they do live even in the wild. It's rare, it's not an average thing. So let's get back to my buck uh, to finish the presentation out. Uh, we know that we got to at least two and a half years old on the last slide I showed, right? So this is a real world example of a deer that I guessed his age based on photos, um, killed him with my bow and wanted to know how old it was. And I imagine many of you do the same thing or will want to. So I wanted to get this deer age. So I actually shared um, picture, these pictures of the jawbones to Joe Hamilton, who our founder, who's um, aged more jawbones than I think anybody in the world, uh, certainly more than anybody I've ever met and Kip. And we all kind of came to the same estimate, which made me feel good. And I did not tell him about the deer, how much it weighed or send them pictures. Um, but I'm going to guide you through the process of, of aging it as well. So we got to at least two and a half. And then we get to question three, is the dentine 
visibly wider than the surrounding enamel on M1. And so I have a side and top view for you folks. And as you're looking at it, follow those dash lines up to the top of the screen, it's that fourth tooth back, and take a guess. What are you thinking? Is that brown wider than the enamel on either side? And you can type it in, you don't have to, but if you said yes, you're gonna bring that deer to at least three and a half years old. If you said no, he would have been a two and a half year old buck. Hopefully you had that in your mind. I'm sure many of you've already moved back to the next tooth. Uh, but before we do that, I'm blowing it up to show you an example. I got the red dash lines there to show a real close up and also to describe something. You gotta look really close at these teeth folks because you can see the brown um, and you can almost see a glimmer of white there's actually almost a creamy whitish brown color that's actually in between there that is still dentine. Some of it can get bleached out, but the enamel is this really hard material. It's got a, sh a sheen to it that the dentine doesn't. And so sometimes looking really close helps. But yeah, we all said yes. Uh, so this deer was at least three and a half years old based on tooth replacement and wear. Moving back a tooth to the M2. So we're now on the fifth tooth back from the front. If you said yes to that tooth, uh, you'd say he's at least four and a half years old. If you said no, you'd stay at three and a half. So let's blow that up. And here's where that subjectivity really starts to come in. I think on the cusp on the front, this is your right side, it's visibly wider. But the one on the back, it's chipped a little bit. That's not from me, uh, but it, it's chipped a little bit and it's, it's close to being even. Um, you would then look at the other side and look at both, both sides of the jawbone and just kind of come up with, with a guess. Um, I thought collectively between both sides, this looked four and a half. So did Kip, so did Mr. Joe Hamilton. We all said, yeah, looks like he's at least four and a half years old. Oh. If you move back to the last tooth, you'd ask the same question. I'm kind of repeating myself a lot here. If you said yes, it'd be at last, least five and a half. If you said no, you stayed at four and a half. And on this example, um, I clearly it's not. There's a very thin line of dentine. And so it's no. So we stay at four and a half. So let me share with you a picture of the buck on the huff about three days before I killed him, or a couple of days before I killed him. Um, Judging on the body, this is not what we're talking about tonight. Uh, I think we've done an aging on the hoof talk. If not, we'll do one this fall uh, on the same seminar uh, webinar series. But using the technique that we put in our newsletter every Thursday, I judge this deer at four and a half. So the jawbone made me feel real good. Um, I thought he was four and a half years old based on his body conformation and a lot of things. This is November 1st in, in New York State. Um, that's what the deer looked like in the harvest photo. You see a trail camera picture later that night, different, different uh, camera location. And I'm just gonna throw you uh, in a photo of a yearling the day before. Um, so that's a one-year-old uh, and the buck I killed. So I was feeling real, real glad and to the point where when I walked by one of the trail cameras, I was doing some fist pumps for my buddy so they could see it. Um, however, uh, I sent a tooth in for cement amanuli because I wanted to see. And cement manual results came back. I'm sure you're guessing. It came back as actually three and a half years old with a rating of B. It was a three to four guess, and they thought it was three and a half. Um, this deer weighed 186 pounds dressed, uh, dressed weight. That that weight says four years old. The, the aging on the hoof photo says four. Tooth replacement said four, but cementum said three. Um, was he four? Or was he three? I really don't know. Um, my guess is that he was four, but um, you use all this information, you bring it together. And I was as shocked as you'd imagine. I said, I thought the deer was at least four and a half. And that's what you do when you, when you take a deer and you send these jaw bones in, it's not going to be clear cut. You're going to use the technique, but you're going to use other information to help you determine around what the age of the deer uh, was. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, next you, you harvest a deer, I hope you give it a try. And again, we have tons of, of uh, resources. This video will actually be on our YouTube channel going forward. So this will be a new resource. You have that link that Ben put in the chat. And uh, we have that other series of, uh, on our YouTube channel too 
that over 500,000 people have viewed. So if you haven't seen that, check it out. So this is my contact information. Uh, as I said at the beginning, if you ever want us to age a jawbone, we'd be happy to take a look at it. And that's all I got, Kip. Hope you guys enjoyed it. All right, very good, Matt. Very well done. And if uh, you will go ahead and stop sharing your screen, we can get us all back here. Very good. And uh, Matt, I know I got to look at that job one before. I got to look at the pictures. I still say he's four and a half. So uh, I am I am with you on that one. So, uh, and like you mentioned earlier, even cement manual is not an exact science, you know, very, very accurate to within a year. And just the fact that it came back a B rating rather than an A rating, um, I'm going to bump up. And uh, I think that uh, that you shot a four-year-old. So congratulations again. So the fist pump was was worthy then, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And for everybody, what Matt didn't tell you is actually it's his neighbor that shot that deer. It just like him <laughs> poke with it. It's his neighbor's camera. So uh, everybody likes Matt. Uh, feels bad if Matt doesn't kill a nice deer. So it wasn't really Matt's deer, but uh, he, has a, he has a good friend next door. So now obviously Matt's deer. Excellent job, Matt. First question for you. Uh, it's actually a two-part one. Does supplemental feeding or mild winters lessen the accuracy level for the cement manually technique? Well, I'll, I'll answer that in two parts. For uh, the winter part of the question, one thing I did not mention, I appreciate uh, the question, is that the further south you go in the country, uh, the less uh, accurate cementum annuli technique can actually work, um, mostly because of the, the uh, deposition of some of the uh, materials that happen there. Um, the tooth replacement and wear technique uh, would not change that much. So it's really not really dependent on that only because you're looking at certain locations, they're going to experience some of those. In terms of supplemental feed, uh, Kip, do you want to answer that part of the question? Sure. Um, supplemental feed would, would absolutely not have any impact on cement and manuli, um, simply because that's just a, a look at uh, stress periods during the year, the winter stress period, which lays that layer of cementum. So uh, it, it wouldn't matter anything that the deer eat uh, wouldn't have any impact at all on the, on the uh, cementum manuli part of that. And actually, Matt, that probably actually goes into a neat question. Of, um, how about this? I'll ask this one. Um, just if a deer lives in uh, a place that has more sandy soil versus more loamy or clay soil, does that impact uh, estimates of the tooth wire replacement like you gave tonight? That's, that's been a question that's been asked over the years, and actually some relatively recent research has come out. Um, a person out of Texas A&M, Kingsville, presented, I think it was two years ago at the Southeast Deer Study Group, uh, that uh, it they had shown that, uh, for the most part, um, soils do not impact uh, jawbone aging as much as we may have thought originally. Oh, I agree. I agree. So uh, that's right. That was that was a big myth for a long time. And it, it sounds like it ought to work, right? If you're eating more stuff and but deer aren't eating the sand, they aren't eating the dirt. So uh, yep. yeah, that, that's not impacting two point replacement either. I'm trying to remember they sampled deer across the country. I'm trying to remember how many samples they tested, but it was only two years ago that this project had been done. So we're still learning a ton about deer, even how to age them by their teeth. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any other questions that folks have, you're welcome to, to put them in the Q&A there and uh, we'll be sure to get to them. Um, Matt, next question is, uh, can you explain how to remove a jawbone? Great question. Uh, so there's a couple different ways uh, that you can remove a jawbone. Um, one of the ways that we teach people in our deer steward classes is use a cool, a, a really nice tool um, that is called the jawbone removal, where you, uh, we also have instructional videos on this, uh, sir, where you can go and watch this. Um, you pry the deer's mouth open, you uh, look straight down through the mouth, uh, you use the tool to keep it propped open and use a set of shears to clip the back of the jawbone uh, where it curves up and goes into the, to the skull above the teeth. Uh, and then you can hook behind it and pull out and it, and it just pops out. It's pretty easy. Um, if, if you don't have access to a, that tool, there's only a couple of places that sell them. Um, you can make one uh, and you can also just cut it out, but believe it or not, as, as complicated as the process looks uh, by using that tool, it's relatively easy to do it, especially once you, you practiced a couple of times. In fact, one of the videos on our YouTube channel, uh, Ben's actually putting it in our chat 
right now. Thanks, Ben. Um, is a video of Kip showing you how to do it with one of the tools that we, we have sold in the past out of our store. Very good, Matt. Next question is, uh, does it matter which side of the deer's jaw you use? I tend to, that's a great question. I tend to look at both sides. I really do try to remove both, both jaw bones or both sides of the jaw bone if I have the ability to, because there are sometimes differences, slight differences in where, so it does not matter which side you look at um, the, the differences between the two sides does not very much, but it, it'll come down to in those cases, like the buck I just showed where there was a tooth I wasn't really sure on. So I wanted to look at the other side. So I've come at least to the deer that I really want to know their age that I've become accustomed to actually getting both sides out and looking at it. And if it's a deer you're caping out, you can get that out pretty easily because you're going to have the whole hide removed anyway. Next question, does forage quality, for example, woody browse versus agricultural crops affect wear rate? Uh, that is a yes. Uh, forage quality is where they wear. That is what they eat. So if they're eating pretty uh, fibrous material a lot of the year, uh, it is going to wear faster than in some places that don't have uh, as much or has access to a lot of really palatable forbs and other uh, plant material. But remember again, you're getting these ages and you're comparing them with within a either region or even down to the property. So the other deer that are being killed uh, from that same property are gonna be experiencing the same wear. So comparing a jawbone in Northern New York where I live uh, to a buck or doe that's taken on a property in Tennessee or Texas, um, they may wear slightly different because of what they're eating. Um, but I really, what I wanna do is look at it across time um, within the same property or region. Good point. And uh, why slightly different, um, um, you're talking half a year or a year. We're not looking, you're not talking two no. or three years difference of wear criteria. Correct. Very good. Uh, any impact on wear or replacement due to early born versus late born fawns? I don't think so. Do you know? I don't think so. It, because yeah. there's always a little bit of a variety or variation with any given year anyway. So, um, you know, particularly in the northern U.S. where most fawns are born over a very short time. Um, no, not maybe in some places in the southeast where you get, you know, multiple months in between. You know, it's sometimes, Matt, you know, I've looked at jaw bones, you're like, man, that is absolutely a betweener. You know, is it two or is it three? Some of that might play into, you know, was it born a few months later than others? But uh, I think that's where that variety or variation would come in. Mm. All right. How about this? Oh, I like this one. Do you need to remove the jaw bone to age it? Uh, yeah, you really should remove the jaw bone to age it. Um, it's really difficult to see the wear on those last couple cusps of the last tooth and almost impossible. And they are often the most important teeth to be able to look at or parts of the tooth. Um, one of the things that we teach folks that uh, when they are removing a jawbone is to be real careful about not chipping it because you do want to look at those, those back very high level. And when I say high, like elevation, those last couple cusps in the last tooth, the jawbone slants up in the back and those last cups are really high. And I, I said there while I was giving the presentation, not for me, that one chip, it was because I take pride in the fact that I try not to break the teeth when I'm trying to get it out. Um, but yeah, you really should, sir, that, that asked the question, try to get the jaw, the jawbone out of the the, the deer, even if it's not using a tooth removing uh, or jawbone removal tool, just use a knife, cut away the cheek, and you can start working your way around the jawbone and then pry it out uh, to get a better look if you have to, even if it's not fully removed. But you want to be able to so see all six of the permanent teeth, premolars and molars from the side and from the top, and you can't do that when it's in the mouth of the deer. Good point. We have one more question, which is, uh, is actually a clarification, I think, of one of the questions. And then we'll do the final announcements and the prize giveaway uh, relative to the early versus late fawn. And uh, this person said, you know, a, a June fawn versus an October fawn. Would you see difference during the fall there? Yeah, that late in the year, you definitely would see. Um, if a fawn is born that late, you would see differences in wear because it's, I mean, think about when we give these ages, uh, I'm putting the half year mark on all of them. It's because they were assumed born in the spring. If you do send in a tooth, um, 
to to get cementum annuli tested, they're all gonna they're always going to ask you the kill date or approximate kill date if it's a deer you found dead, um, uh, and, and they will give you an age estimate back based on that date because they're going to to assume that the deer was born sometime between probably April and June. Good point, and I think that's one of the reasons I also ask uh, you to to put the state in. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where it comes from. So for a little uh, help from that. So, well, great job, Matt. Excellent presentation, extremely informative. Well done. I like the, the slides and the new pictures there. So uh, I like the artistic touch to that. Great job answering the questions. Everybody, uh, we talked a couple times about being an NDA member. I certainly hope you are, or if not, I hope uh, after seeing some of this tonight and hearing what's going on, we can encourage you to join and, uh, and be one of our members. We put a link in uh, the chat tonight, but uh, if you didn't see that, you can go right to DeerAssociation.com and join. We would love to have you uh, become a member. Uh, upcoming webinars next month, July 12th, we have Brian Grossman uh, who, from NDA as well. Brian's a wildlife biologist and uh, works in our communications department. Um, Brian is a big public land hunting guy. So uh, his talk is on enhanced scouting. He's going to teach you how to scout your hunting property fast and effectively, whether this is private land or public land. Uh, Brian is, is extremely adept at the scouting end, and uh, so we try to cover some habitat stuff, some biology stuff, some hunting stuff as well, so uh, that's going to be our presentation next month, and uh, all right, drum roll please, we have our, our prize giveaway, uh, our three poster set, this is going to go to the first person who answers this question correctly, uh, type your answer in the chat, I have the chat box open, so not the Q&A, but type it in the chat box, I have that open right now, and we will see the, the, who answers this correctly first the question is relative to aging a jawbone if you're looking at a jawbone and it has six teeth you know it's at least uh, one and a half years old the first molar the dentine is noticeably wider than the enamel the second molar the dentine is noticeably wider than the enamel the third molar the dentine is not wider than the enamel how old is it four it's so it would be they are flying in Let's see who got, the answer would be four and a half because the question would be yes, yes, and no. So four and a half, now I've scrolled way past. Uh, first four and a half is Gary Landry. So Gary, congratulations. Do this, Gary. Uh, I think that I may have your email address, but email me your mailing address. My email is kip at dearassociation.com. That's Kip with one P, K-I-P at DeerAssociation.com. Give me your mailing address, uh, Gary, and uh, we will be sure to get that poster series uh, right on its way to you. So uh, with that, we are right at uh, 8.02, so uh, right at the top of the hour. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you're all doing well. Have a, have a wonderful, wonderful June. Uh, Pull some jawbones uh, this fall. If you have some in your in your uh, camp or your house, grab some now. Take a look at it and uh, come see us uh, next month when we talk about scouting. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Good night, everybody. Thanks.